Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, the director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Charlotte Cote, a professor in the Department of American Indian Studies at the University of Washington. Dr. Cote holds a PhD and an MA in Comparative Ethnic Studies from the University of California at Berkeley, a BA in Political Science from Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, and a diploma in Broadcast Communications from the BC Institute of Technology. She is affiliated faculty in UW's Jackson School Canadian Studies Center. She is from the Neutral Nuth community of Tishot on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Cote has dedicated her personal and academic life to creating awareness around Indigenous health and wellness issues and in working with Indigenous peoples and communities in revitalizing their traditional food ways. Her current book, A Drum in One Hand, A Sakai in the Other, Stories of Indigenous Food Sovereignty from the Northwest Coast, examines how cultural foods play a major role in physical, emotional, spiritual, and dietary wellness. She is also the author of the book, Spirits of Our Wailing Ancestors, Revitalizing Macaw and Neutral Nuth Traditions, as well as numerous articles. Cote serves as series editors for the UW Press's Indigenous Confluences series, and she is the founder and chair of UW's annual Living Breath Indigenous Foods Symposium. On October 6, 2022, Cote will give a lecture titled Sumas, The River That Runs Through Us, as the 2022-23 Robert D. Clark Lecturer. Her talk is the first in the Oregon Humanities Center's 2022-23 themed speaker series on the topic of belonging. Thanks, Charlotte, for coming on the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. Uklama Fautis Mayol, Zisha Aksuma, Histak Shitla, Zuma As, Zishat, Port Alberni. In my language, and just sharing my Indigenous name, with which is Fautis or Fautis. And um, I am from the nation of Zishat, and Zishat is on the west coast of Vancouver Island. We're part of the larger nation that makes up the Inuchanoth Nation um, with over 12,000 members, and we have about 1,200 members in our community. And we're in an area called Zuma'as, and Zuma'as actually is the name of the river that runs through our community, that feeds and sustains our community. And throughout the years, as a result of colonization, we lost that name for this area, and it is now recognized as the city of Port Alberni. And uh, that is where I am uh, zooming in from today. I've been here for the summer, um, enjoying the wonderful uh, time here with my family, fishing, and uh, we've been fishing for the last month. And uh, last night we spent 10 hours canning our salmon. <laughs> So it's been quite um quite wonderful. I couldn't come home for two years because of COVID. So I really made sure that I got a really good visit in when I came this year. And it's been wonderful. You've already started to tell us about your background and the place where you are, where you grew up. Is there anything more about your background or that place that you'd like to share with us? Well, we are um, uh, people who uh, who's... Uh, spiritual connections are um, are embedded within our waterscapes. We have, as I mentioned, Sumaas, um, also known as the Zomas River, uh, that runs through our community and brings the precious salmon to us. So, uh, salmon is a very, very important food in our diet, um, a nutritional, a very nutritious food. And um, it's uh, a place where we have uh, access to a lot of seafoods. So we do most of the foods that we eat are foods that come from the waters that come from our river or come from the oceans. And so that has been um, uh, because of changes, which um, we can talk about is uh, throughout this interview, things that have happened to our communities, um, just having access to those foods has been very difficult throughout the years. But salmon is one food that we have maintained a very important and cultural connection to. Tell us about some of the other traditional foods of your community. Um, well, many people, and including me, grew up harvesting wild uh, kalkawi, which is the wild trailing blackberry. Um, very important uh, food that has a lot of uh, antioxidants. 
um, very nutritious food. It's very different than the blackberry that most people see, which is the Himalayan blackberry, the larger um, blackberry. These are very small blackberries, very tart, and they run on these vines. And you see them throughout our territory. Um, I grew up picking these berries, um, berry picking, um, not just blackberries, but uh, salmon berries, salal berries are very, very important, uh, very, very important cultural foods and also provide a lot of nutrients um, uh, in these kinds of foods as well. Seafoods as well. Um, we were um, a couple of uh, weeks ago when I was in another part of our traditional territory known as the Broken Group Islands. We were harvesting oysters right on the right on the beach where you just break open the oyster and eat the oyster right from the shell, which is one of the best ways to eat oysters. <laughs> and halibut as well. And also um, land-based foods, um, elk and deer are also very, very important foods in our diet and many people still hunt today. So one of the many important arguments in your work and in your book, A Drum in One Hand, A Sakai in the Other, is that settler colonialism has detrimentally impacted indigenous health and well-being. Tell us about that. Tell us how that's happened and what has happened. Yeah, well, the history of settler colonialism and the resulting economic, social, and cultural mar marginalization has really had profound impacts on our, uh, in our indigenous communities, especially on our health, on our, on our, um, individual and community health. Um, many of the health issues and health disparities that we have today are linked to the disposition of our homelands, um, the inability to access uh, nutritious foods um, or to access our harvesting areas. And so it's really impacted our ability to stay healthy. Um, not being able to harvest the way we used to harvest, harvest not just foods, but also harvest medicines in our community. We still um, see these uh, issues, um, especially in, in uh, the land claims that here up in Canada that we um, have been negotiating with the federal and provincial governments in order to have the the capacity to um, uh, to sustain ourselves within our own homelands and having the uh, the the uh, land to do that and having access to the waters to do that. So we still see the impacts of uh, colonization through the perpetuation of settler colonialism within our communities. Um, the economic disparities still exist. We have uh, extreme socioeconomic conditions within our many of our indigenous communities, and it makes it just very hard to be um, not just um, physically um, healthy, but also emotionally and culturally healthy when you're constantly facing um, those kinds of economic hardships. And a lot of that has to do with the perpetuation of settler colonialism. So you've already started to answer my next question. Obviously, from what you've said, it's clear that food sovereignty is central to indigenous efforts of decolonization. Mm -hmm. so first, how do you define food sovereignty? Well, food sovereignty really is, it, you know, the, the, the definition that I use is a definition that was created by La Villa Campesina, a large uh, ag ag agrarian based um, uh, community of small scale farmers and uh, peasants um, who came up with this, um, uh, created this definition of food sovereignty as being the right to uh, nutritious foods, to cultural foods, and also the right to harvest and process these foods. That is, they were really pushing back against um, uh, larger global discussions around foods and uh, especially around um, uh, around um, achieving health, uh, food security within um, various communities throughout the world and the kinds of food regimes that were being put forward were doing little to achieve that. And so it was really a pushback against multinational corporations um, having the largest voices at those tables. And so what food sovereignty really does is bring back into the bring back the voices of people working within these communities um, back onto those larger tables, um, those larger um, uh, discussions around 
um, achieving food security within our communities throughout the world. And what does it mean to indigenize food sovereignty? Well, this is something that I really thought about when I was looking at food sovereignty many years ago, when I really started doing this kind of research around what food sovereignty is and what does it mean for Indigenous people. And um, many scholars have looked at this and, um, and developed their own ideas and concepts around it, what Indigenous food sovereignty is. But for me, it really is um, thinking about not just it being a right, you know, that, that we have the right, the political right to, um, to enact food sovereignty, but really what does it mean as a responsibility to me as an Indigenous person? Um, to enact food sovereignty or to practice food sovereignty. What does that mean within our communities? So indigenizing food sovereignty really places that conversation back into our communities about what we're doing. How are we achieving food sovereignty? How are we achieving food security in our communities? And what do we need to do to achieve that? So indigenizing, it really looks at a, has a kind of a restorative aspect to it, restoring a balance in our communities, restoring new, um, um, health and wellness within our communities. And it really um, uh, um, connects to a lot of what um, Indigenous scholar Robin Wall Kimmerer says in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, about um, uh, our connections to our communities are not just, um, um, how did she put it? It's um, reciprocity, that we have to think about reciprocity, that if we're, uh, if the land and the waters are giving something to us and the plants and animals, then we need to give something back in return. So there, it, it, it's embedded within these notions of responsibility um, and creating relationships built on that reciprocity, as, um, as uh, Kim Murr points out in her wonderful book, Braiding Sweetgrass. I should I should say just at this point that um, in 2018, Robin Wall Kimmerer gave the same lecture that you're giving this year uh, and that her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, has been the U of O's common reading book for the past two academic years. So I just wanted to get those <laughs> those plugs in there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how your community uh, and uh, has been engaged in food sovereignty, efforts of food sovereignty? Yeah, well, one is um, maintaining connections to our salmon. So we do have um, an economic resource um, uh, program here in the larger New Chonolf tribal, um, the larger New Chonolf area. So my Zishat community is where I am today. Um, I'm in the Zishat Admin building, um, which is in what is uh, called the town of Port Alberni. Um, but our new Channel Tribal Council, which um, oversees, it's kind of the lobbying, the larger political lobbying group for all the 14 new Channel tribes is just up the road from here. It's actually within our, our, um, our ancestral homelands. And um, they created, um, uh, organized, uh, they created a, um, a, um, why am I not being able to think of the word here? Um, an organization, I guess, called U'athluk. U'athluk in our language means um, taking care of or to take care of. And it focuses on our fishery and the importance of fishery, especially salmon. So they bring in elders for um, it, to be the as the knowledge holders to um, to create policies, uh, develop strategies around ancestral wisdom. Um, they also um, have a lot of programs that focus on the youth, to have the youth engaged in um, management that is um, based in our cultural values, in our worldviews. And I think that is very, very important rather than just establishing a resource regime that has no connections to who we are culturally or, um, or spiritually. Um, also, in looking at the reviving of food um, the security here in our community. Um, I write about this in my book, my sister Gail, uh, who uh, works as the crisis care coordinator here in our Tishad administration building. Eight years ago, 
um, decided to create a community garden. And one of the reasons for that was because of many, because of the health issues she saw in our community um, and uh, wanted to find, you know, wanted to do something as a way to help to, to uh, create a, a garden that would provide nutritious foods. At first, the garden um, that she um, envisioned didn't have any traditional foods in it. It was foods like kale, spinach, tomatoes, um, you know, these kinds of foods, but foods that she knew that were nutritious just to get, um, um, just to um, create a place where our community could come and access these kinds of foods. What is important in what she did was that it moved, her garden moved beyond just being a space of for uh, growing nutritious foods. It also became a space to um, uh, let go of a lot of the historical trauma that our people in our communities are experiencing, especially today with what has been happening here in Canada. And I don't know if many people in the United States know this, but a few years ago, they were um, uh, going to start doing, um, I think, um, construction. I can't remember what it was, but at the a school that was in um, that used to it was a former boarding school site in the community of Kamloops, and they uncovered all of these bodies of children that were buried there, and it set forth, um, a, you know, it 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 really brought out in our communities that pain that we've been holding inside of us because of not, uh, because many people who went to those schools knew what had happened, that there were children that never made it home. So when my sister decided to create that garden, she created it on a former boarding school site, which where I am, it's like literally two minutes up the road here. And it's a, a place now where the, our New Channel Tribal Council office building is. But there, you know, when people would go there, survivors of those schools, when they would go up to that office, they'd be re-triggered by seeing that space. And she said, this is where I want my garden. Because when people go up there and see my garden, it's going to give them a sense of pride in who they are. It's going to make them feel good that there's something good coming out of that space. And she said, you know, when they first took the first shovel and tried to put in that ground, they couldn't even, the ground was so hard, they couldn't even put the shovel in. Yet that first year that they grew, um, that grew these um, um, vegetables and fruit there, they grew, it was like Jurassic Park kale. I mean, it was the, the land really needed to heal. And it's been such an amazing, major, amazing project that our community garden and what it's done for our, not just individual health here in Zishot, but also community health. Many people go to that garden now, especially during COVID, the last two years of COVID, when many people were afraid to go to the go to the markets, to go to the stores to get food, they went to Gail's garden. And so I think that's it, you know, I wanted when when I thought about what I would put in this book, my my previous my my new book, that that story needs to go in there because people need to understand how important that is to create these spaces um, in our communities. If it's a community garden or whatever you grow in there, it brings people together. It's focused on nutrition. It's on our lands and it's our lands that are growing. It's the, you know, it's the nutrients in our lands that are growing those foods. And so throughout the years, she's expanded it. She has brought in some traditional uh, foods as well, um, but her, her, her um, uh, goal was not to disrupt 
the land around it. Like if if something wanted to grow there, she she let it grow there. If dandelions grew there, she let it grow there. But she wasn't going to start moving things out of our out of the forests and put them there because that you know that it wouldn't it wouldn't be right to move a plant from its natural place and put it into kind of this grid like garden so it's been um it's been a uh, process and a wonderful process it's been growing and growing um this year though we've seen some changes in the garden and that's because as i mentioned earlier about the uh, school um and these un um these um these former graves or these undiscovered these graves that were discovered at boarding schools, our community now is going through this um, process. And so where Gail's garden is, they have been scanning the ground. So she hasn't really been able to do anything with the garden um, because we've had for the last um, uh, month and a half, we've had people here digging in, um, digging throughout our community and scanning um, the land so that um, we can find many of these bodies that are these are these graves of of children who um, never made it home. And with us, and it's I want to also acknowledge a shirt I'm wearing, Every Child Matters, um, to just let everybody know that this is very, very important, this work that's being done, not just to understand that historical trauma, that legacy, um, that we are left with through the boarding school system, but to understand how it impacted our health. Because many people who went to those schools never had access to healthy foods. The foods that were given to children in those schools were deplorable. I, many of the people in the generation above me went to these schools. And I grew up hearing those stories, stories of starvation. They even... A few years ago, a food scholar in Canada uncovered some documents about boarding schools and how here in Canada, some of the schools were being used as for the, the children in these schools were being used in experiments about health. Um, and some were purposely being um, uh, were purposely being fed, being underfed as a way to understand nutritional values of foods in the 1940s and 50s. I know people who went to the, my school here, the school that's in the middle of our community, Alberni Indian Residential School, who say that they really believe that they were part of that experiment. The one thing is they never ever asked the families and they never ever told the children. So if they were part of the experiment, they wouldn't have known. So it's just, it's, it's a history that I wanted to bring in. I know it's not directly connected to food sovereignty, but it is very, very important because it's really impacted our um, individual and community health, what had happened to many of our people who went to those schools. So you've just given us a really uh, powerful example of the importance of story storytelling to your method and you you say in your book that you use storytelling as a methodology yeah tell us what you mean by that and why storytelling is so important for your work and for your community yeah well storytelling is what i think of um as an act of resistance it really is a, a form of, of decolonization and when you center an indigenous narrative, it really challenges settler colonialism. When you center the indigenous voice, it's, um, you know, many people don't understand how settler colonialism has impacted our communities and still impacts our communities in many ways. We, you know, it moves beyond just the removal of our homelands or the inability to access harv harvesting sites or removing us from those waters that sustain us. A, a major part of settler colonialism was silencing our vi voices. Um, the boarding school system, part of federal Indian policy in both United States and Canada was part of that. Silence 
protecting our voices. And so it really is a way to push back against settler colonialism and also to create spaces that, that um, recognize and affirm our oral traditions because we are people who are based in oral, tradi um, oral traditions and, and that storytelling, oral storytelling tradition. So stories um, really um, help people understand who we are, help us in those, in the sharing of those stories, who we are, it's connected to our, our connected to our, our, our identities. Um, stories um, tell us where we come from, you know, and they really are an act of sovereignty by reaffirming our identities, our values and our worldviews. So I really wanted to make sure that this book was framed in stories, stories that I grew up with, being born, born and raised in my community of Zishat, and stories from people in my community who were uh, willing to share with me their experiences as a Zishat person, as an Indigenous person, and to have the book framed in that, so that though that becomes the theory that is projected throughout the text, that story is theory, and the stories come from people within our communities here in the Northwest Coast. So related uh, approach in your book is you include numerous words and phrases from your Indigenous language. Why is that an important thing to do? And, and, and um, how does that relate to your larger goals as an Indigenous person and an, an Indigenous scholar? Yeah, so... Um, it comes from, um, I think just, I mean, I grew up around the language. My mother was a fluent speaker. My mother, Evelyn, was a fluent speaker of, uh, of New Chanolth. We have um, um, very distinct dialects as you go from the northern part of New Channel territory on the west coast of Vancouver Island to the southern part, um, to the point where the dialects are very, very different um, from, you know, from the top, from the north into the south. My mother knew all of those dialects. She was born and raised in, in the language. Um, the one thing also that I share in my book is the reason why my mother was able to maintain and retain her language was because she didn't go to boarding school. She, um, my mother was born blind and um, she did regain through some surgeries when she was young, some um, eyesight, but um, not to the point where she could really see. I mean, she could see shadows, but that was it. So her, my grandparents, her parents did put her in boarding school, but um, there was nobody there who had the patience or the will to want to educate her because they would have had to spend extra time with her. And my mother always said it was a blessing in disguise that she never ever had to go to boarding school. She didn't have her language and her culture beat out of her. So I was raised in that language. But the time that I was raised in that time period, many people were speaking English, especially speak people my, my age. So my mother would speak English or speak the language to me. I lived right next door to my grandparents, her parents. They would, sp or they would speak the language to me, or it's a shut language, but I would always answer back in, in English. But, and they never corrected me. Well, no one knew back then that our languages were going to be threatened. And so I really thought about that, especially with this book. And I put some of our language in my other book, but this one, I really wanted to express the importance of that, not just including words and phrases, but the importance of creating spaces that center those, those words and those phrases um, and to put them in the way we write them. So that, you know, I had to think about that. Do I want to put them in, put the words in phonetically so that an English speaking person could understand them or a non new channel or non shot? I thought, no, I will put it in the glossary. I'll put you know, so that if people want to learn how to say the words, it'll be in the book. But I want to put those words in the way that we see them, the way we write them and we see them. And I think it really is a part of that act of resistance as well, that we're going to use the words, those words that I grew up with. There are many 
words that it wasn't until I was older that I knew the English word. Like, for example, we have herring. Herring um, here are very, very important uh, traditional food. And in the springtime, herring spawn. And when they spawn or get ready to spawn, our people will put out either seaweed on these. Um, they'll make these um, uh, kind of, uh, what would you say, um, kind of like fences, maybe, they where they can put uh, um, seaweed in the water so that when the herring come in they'll spawn on top of the seaweed and we also put hemlock branches down as well and the this the spawn they'll spawn on those branches and then you take the branches out and pull the spawn off and eat it um, it's known in our language as sihmo and for many years I never knew I just knew it was sihmo I didn't know where <laughs> came from or what it was it wasn't until I was older and so I thought why not why not share our words why not share that part of my culture in this book so I really really thought it was important to do that and plus during COVID there was a language class a Tishat language class or a new channel language class um, out of Victoria that used to meet in person and then during COVID it ended up going virtual and so I joined that class and which was a joy that I could stay connected to uh, people in my community through that class and also learn more about my language so I wanted to share that in this book. Well it's, it's such a powerful part of what you do Charlotte, we're almost at the end of our time. This is going to be my last question. Would you tell us a little bit about the annual food symposium you organize at University of Washington? Yeah, so this uh, food symposium, we're in our 11th year. We uh, just had our 10th anniversary this May in person, which was very exciting because the last two years we couldn't hold it. 2020, we postponed it. And then 2021, we had a virtual uh, symposium. Um, it is a, a wonderful two-day event. Um, this year, it'll be the, <laughs> let me get my calendar, I believe the 12th and 13th. Yes, 12th and 13th of May at our beautiful Wethlebalt, our intellectual house at the University of Washington. And um, it brings together people from all over the United States and Canada. We've also had speakers from Mexico. And the last uh, four years, we've developed a wonderful relationship with the Maori people from New Zealand. And we've had Maori scholars um, come for the first time, come to our symposium in 2019. And um, they have, uh, and they also joined in 2021. And this year, virtually, we um, we zoomed them into our in-person event. And so it's a wonderful um, relationship that we've developed with Mari scholars doing work in food sovereignty. And it brings people together to discuss um, issues around um, food, uh, indigenous food sovereignty, food security. But we also look at other issues like climate change, how climate change, what how climate change is impacting um, our foods, our traditional foods and our harvesting sites. We also look at um, treaty rights, especially fishing rights and water rights, and um, also other issues around health and wellness. We've had people um, present on uh, traditional birthing methods, for example. So anything that to do with traditional foods as well as health and wellness in our communities is um, is part of, of that uh, two-day event. Sounds like an amazing event and uh, what a great legacy for the past uh, decade, incredible. Yeah, so Charlotte, yeah. I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And we are so looking forward to seeing you in person next week at the University of Oregon. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it too. I've been speaking with Charlotte Cote, a professor in the Department of American Indian Studies at the University of Washington and the author of A Drum in One Hand, A Sakai in the Other, Stories of Indigenous Food Sovereignty from the Northwest Coast. On October 6, 2022, Cote will give a lecture titled Tsuma'as, The River That Runs Through Us, as the 2022-2023 Robert D. Clark Lecturer. Her talk is the first in the Oregon Humanities Center's 2022-23 themed speaker series on the topic of belonging. Thanks so much for watching. Music